Have you ever watched one of those movies where things already start off kind of bad, but then just keep progressively getting worse until before you know it, you're looking around like, wow, could anything else possibly go wrong? Well, that's essentially today's story, so buckle up. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to my channel. I am Shelby Nave, and today we are going to be talking about America's actual and not so glamorous origin story. Let me tell you friends, it has been a hot minute since I have written and sat down to film a video essay. As much as I love making movie commentary videos, video essays are really kind of where I thrive, not by numbers or views, but by like personal fulfillment. I really like to study certain subjects and then talk about the things that I've learned, especially if the topic is something that is like commonly misconstrued. That being said, I feel like if we were on one of those like late night talk shows, where they do the whole segment of the host like going out into public and asking random strangers like basic trivia questions and then making fun of them on national TV because they don't know the answer. <laughs> what president is on the $20 bill? Uh, the $20 bill? Mm -hmm. George Washington? No. Oh my god. To Jackson. Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson. <laughs> you know, that whole thing. But I feel like, generally speaking, if people were to be asked what they thought America's true origin story was, most people would probably say Thanksgiving, Plymouth Rock, the Pilgrims, yada yada. Which, weirdly enough, I feel like I can't really blame people for thinking that because me growing up as a kid, I was always under the impression that the start of America, at least as we know it, began with the story of Thanksgiving. It's very interesting to me that Thanksgiving often gets all of the credit for being America's start, when in reality, its true origin story happened long before the Pilgrims stepped foot on Plymouth Rock. In fact, not only were there already a bunch of European countries over in America trying to colonize it before the Pilgrims came around, but Plymouth Rock wasn't even Britain's first successful settlement attempt in the New World. It was Jamestown. Hi, welcome. This is the topic today. We're gonna be talking about Jamestown. <laughs> it was nearly exactly a year ago that I made my video talking about the history of Thanksgiving, which is honestly a video that I'll probably end up referencing at some point during this video. So if you wanna go check that out, I will leave a link in the description or I'll leave a card. In that video, I go really in depth into like not only the history of the pilgrims, but also why I think their story was kind of chosen and glorified as America's origin story over Jamestown which we'll be exploring further today. However, before we get started, just a friendly reminder that I am not an expert nor a historian, just a history enthusiast. Also, with this story in particular, there's just, there's a lot that goes into it. I try to stick to the major points of it, but obviously I won't be able to touch on every single thing that happened throughout the Jamestown timeline. Just wanted to let you know that in advance. But as always, I do my best to fact check myself, but if I say something today that you don't think is accurate, please nicely let me know in the comments below. Now let's get into it. So, Jamestown. Where do we start? Probably at the beginning, I guess. If we go back to the discovery of America, you know, Christopher Columbus sailing the ocean blue in 1492 to discover the new world, even though you could argue that it was Leif Erikson and the Vikings who discovered America nearly half a millennium before then, but that's a topic for another time. Anyway, after Columbus made his voyage to the new world, Spain was pretty much dominating the race to colonize America. Or sorry, the Americas, both of them. And I feel like a common misconception, probably probably due to the Thanksgiving story is that the English were the first to get here when it really was the Spanish. Obviously the winners, if you will, are the ones who usually end up writing the history books, so I feel like that's why that little fact is usually commonly overlooked. I mean, if things weren't successful for the English back then, then we probably would all be speaking Spanish or French right now. But anyway, in the beginning, most of the British efforts at settlement in the Americas were failures. I'd like to bring up the Roanoke Colony or the Lost Colony if you will, of 1585, which was Britain's actual first attempt at settlement, and everybody mysteriously disappeared, so I guess you could say that was a failure. <laughs> I talk about the Roanoke Colony in my Croatoan video. If you are interested, I will also leave a link in the description and a card somewhere. So now, 1606 is the year, and King James I grants a charter for two competing branches of the Virginia Company, which was the Virginia Company of London and the Virginia Company of Plymouth. He grants those charters to make a new voyage and create a settlement in North America. At this time, the entire East Coast minus Florida was actually considered to be Virginia, named after the Virgin Queen, Queen Elizabeth I. 
first. The goal of the voyage was not only to plant an English stake in the New World, but also to search for riches such as gold and silver. Because let's not forget that the New World brought tremendous wealth to Europe, and the French, English, Spanish, and Dutch were all competing and trying to establish settlements in America as well as reap the riches of it. So, in December of 1606, approximately 100 passengers boarded three ships, which were known as the Susan Constant, the Godspeed, and the Discovery, and they started out on their voyage for the New World. The commander of the voyage was a man named Christopher Newport, but another notable name that participated in the trip was, of course, Captain John Smith, which we will talk about his background more in a second, but man, this guy almost didn't even make it to the colony. <laughs> Not only was he accused of plotting mutiny, like, in route on the way to Virginia, which ended up getting him arrested. But in March of 1607, the ships actually stopped in the West Indies because Newport fully intended on executing Smith for causing chaos, but he ended up getting spared and they continued on their journey. In late April of 1607, the ships arrived at the Chesapeake Bay and the colonists opened up their sealed instructions from the Virginia company. And turns out Smith was actually named as one of the colony's like governing council members. So he was released from imprisonment. However, even though he was let go, they did not let him take his spot on the council yet. But he was sworn in like two months later though. So on May 13th, 1607, the colonists landed and chose the destination that would soon be known as Jamestown. It was a narrow peninsula that was nearly an island located on the James River. They thought that this area would be easily defendable since it was mostly surrounded by water. Also Jamestown and the James River are both named after King James I, if that wasn't clear. <laughs> However, the destination that the colonists picked to create this settlement proved to be problematic from the very start. In hindsight, there definitely was a reason why this particular area that they chose to settle on wasn't already inhabited by somebody else, and that's because it was a bad spot. The area was hot, swampy, full of mosquitoes, and had no good source of food or fresh water. It was also a bad place for any type of agriculture or fishing. And to make matters worse, it turns out they had arrived too late to plant any crops and were dealing with one of the biggest droughts that the area has dealt with in a hundred years. So already off to a bit of a rocky start. Not to mention the colonists that came over to America were primarily noblemen and adventurers, or gentlemen if you will. They were not farmers or fishermen or really any sort of person that would be helpful in establishing a colony. They drank a lot, they weren't prepared for the work, and they didn't work very hard. In fact, by early fall of 1607, half of the settlers had already died from starvation and disease no good. Nonetheless though, the colony had begun being established. History.com says, the new settlement initially consisted of a wooden fort built in a triangle around a storehouse for weapons and other supplies, a church, and a number of houses. By the summer of 1607, Newport went back to England with two ships and 40 crew members to give a report to the king and to gather more supplies and colonists. So before we go on about the colony, I do wanna talk about John Smith for a little bit because he is obviously a big player in the story of Jamestown, especially at this point in the timeline. And I think it's important to identify that unlike many of the other colonists that were in Jamestown, Smith was a very capable leader, explorer, and survivalist, I would even say. Before making the voyage to Jamestown, Smith had previously fought in war against the Ottoman Turks. He was captured, escaped, and managed to get out through Poland. The Polish people apparently knew how bad Turkish captivity was, and they actually helped John Smith get out and return to England. All right, guys, I'm sorry. There's people like blowing leaves outside of my house right now. I'm sorry if you can hear that. God, that's annoying. <sighs> Two hours later. All right, hi, it's much later. I have wine now and the people who were doing leaf things outside are finally done, so here we are. So now the question is, where did I leave off? <laughs> All right, I know we were talking about John Smith, so the Polish apparently knew how bad Turkish captivity was and they actually helped John Smith return to England. This in turn caused John Smith to gain a deep respect for the Poles who would soon become a vital part in the survival of the Jamestown colony, but we will come back to that. So in December, of 1607, John Smith and two of his companions were actually captured by Chief Powhatan's brother named o Opecan... Can... Um, one moment. Opechanacano. Opechanacano. That's a name that I am not going to remember. I will do my best. Anyway, Chief Powhatan's brother. 
ended up killing Smith's companions and brought Smith to Powhatan's capital called... Please hold. Vera Wokomoko. Vera Wokomoko. Vera Wokomoko. Vera Wokomoko. Okay, I don't have a lot of confidence in me right now. Anyway, that was the capital. Smith was brought there. And while he was there, it was said that Smith was about to be executed when a young native girl named Pocahontas threw herself over him and prevented him from being executed. It's pretty widely known that the tale of Pocahontas saving Smith and falling in love with him in a sense is at the very least an embellishment if it even happened at all. Not only because Pocahontas was she was 12 at the time. Like, she didn't actually have any romantic interest in Smith like he kind of portrayed her to. You know, she was just way too young. But this also does seem to be fabricated because Smith had a seemingly very similar experience happen to him while he was at war with the Ottoman Turks. Apparently during the war, he was about to be killed when a Turkish maiden also threw herself over him and prevented him from being executed. What are the odds that would happen to you twice? <laughs> I can't help but just imagine John Smith being so so irresistible that women just like flock to him and throw themselves over him being like no take me instead i don't know but smith's memoir which he later wrote about all of these experience like i mean he definitely knew that he was writing for an audience like he was a pretty big name so i guess just take his stories with a grain of salt by the time that john smith was able to actually return to jamestown it was early january of 1608 but when he did get back he was actually blamed for the death of his companions that were killed by the indians and and he was sentenced to hang because of it. However, it just so happens that Newport ended up returning to Jamestown just in time with the first supply of food and settlers and ends up sparing Smith's life again. <laughs> you know, I don't know what sort of charm and sweet talking that Smith has over these people, but he always manages to get spared somehow. So after the first supply, Newport goes back to England again to gather more people and more supplies. He does a lot of these trips back and forth, but the second supply could not have come sooner because by September of 1608, Jamestown was kind of standing on its last legs. Things had gone pretty downhill to say the least. <laughs> Many of the colonists died because of the famine and the diseases that they got drinking the contaminated swamp water. There was a pretty severe lack of resourcefulness and the colonists were just desperate at this time. They kept trying to trade with the Native Americans for food and stuff, but the problem was at the time the English just really didn't have anything that the Native Americans wanted. But when the second supply did arrive, it came with a number of Polish and German citizens who were experienced in different areas of expertise. And because of this, they soon became indispensable to the infant colony. For instance, the Poles helped dig a proper well for good drinking water so people could stop drinking the swamp water, but I would say the biggest contributions that they made was building the first American factory and furnace which they used to make glass. The production of glass was huge for the colony because finally the colonists had something that they could actually trade with the Native Americans. In the future, a lot of times the colonists would get supplies from the Native Americans by defeating them militarily, but in the early days they couldn't do that. They needed to come up with some sort of product that they could actually trade with. And the Polish were a big part of making that happen. Eventually, the colonists started trading other things with natives, such as beads, copper, and iron, and like weapons and tools and stuff like that. John Smith had a lot of respect towards the Poles, and they even saved him one time when he was getting attacked by an Indian warrior. And now that they were helping him create trade between the colonists and the Indians, Smith and Chief Powhatan were able to come to some sort of understanding with each other. And obviously, an understanding was really good to kind of create a, a peace, if you will, among everybody living here. So, in in July of 1609, there was a third supply that was making its way to Jamestown. However, one of the ships that was called the Sea Venture actually got stuck in a hurricane and ended up getting separated from all of the other boats. They actually ended up in Bermuda with all of their passengers, including Newport, Sir Thomas Gates, and John Rolfe. It's Pocahontas' future hobby, but we'll come back to him. Anyway, back in Jamestown, John Smith actually ends up getting elected as president on September 10th, 1608, and he wasted no time trying to strengthen the fort's defenses. He also implemented the whole, like, you don't work, you don't eat mentality, which I think was very necessary for the people who were there. You know, he enforced a lot of stricter rules amongst the colonists and kind of whipped them into shape, I guess you could say. But unfortunately, John Smith wasn't president for very long because he ended up having a gunpowder explosion accident, which may or may not have 
been an intentional attack on him, but he ended up returning to England in October of 1609. With Smith back in England, George Percy was elected Jamestown's new president, and long story short, he just wasn't as good of a leader as Smith was. Apparently, he ended up leaving a lot of the decision-making to a man named John Radcliffe, who was the captain of the Discovery, you know, like one of the original boats that came over, and who was apparently also the villain in Pocahontas, so we'll be getting to see that soon. Unfortunately, when Smith left, not only did a lot of the Poles end up leaving with him, but the understanding that he had formed with Powhatan kind of dissipated and conflicts started happening a lot more regularly. Not to say that conflicts didn't happen when Smith was around, they just seemed to kind of intensify, I think. The peace was just, it wasn't there anymore because the person who made the peace wasn't around. There was a new guy running the show. Percy and other settlers under him made several attempts to buy land from the Native Americans, and I'm sure you can imagine that that didn't go over well. I think the last thing the Native Americans really wanted was to lose any of their land. So some repercussions to this was that Powhatan ended up attacking Jamestown in November of 1609, trapping like 300 settlers. Then in December, he invited a bunch of colonists, including Ratcliffe, to Orpa Orapax? I believe is how you say it, Orapax? Powhatan invited a bunch of people to Orapax, promising to give them food and stuff because they were starving, and he ended up just ambushing and murdering all of them. So, peace was not a thing anymore. <laughs> so yeah, I guess you can say that whatever understanding Smith had formed with Powhatan was now void and tensions were running very high. <laughs> but you know, that might not have even been the worst thing happening during this time period, given that the colonists were heading into the winter of 1609 to 1610, a time that is now known as the Starving Time. And yes, it is very much how it sounds. A very long and brutal winter where the colonists were quite literally probably even more desperate than they were before. Food seemed to always be an issue. The colonists would try to loot anything they could find, but then ended up killing and eating their animals and their pets and even shoe leather. Some even got so desperate that they resorted to cannibalism. Not only did many of them dig up graves of Native Americans and, you know, eat the dead bodies and such, but one man in particular, he killed his wife and ate her, except he kept her head, so. Gotta have a keepsake, I guess. It was just a bad time. It was a real, real bad time. By the time spring came around, 75% of the fort's population had died. Only 60 settlers remained, and I'm sure most of them were wondering if the Jamestown experiment was still worth it. Luckily though, by May of 1610, the survivors of the Sea Venture, remember the ship that got lost in the hurricane, actually ended up making it to Jamestown after spending 10 months in Bermuda building their new ships that were called the Patience and the Deliverance. This was a very important arrival because if you recall, one of the colonists aboard the Sea Venture was John Rolfe, and he's finally arrived at Jamestown. John Rolfe was important because he started the tobacco crop that essentially exploded in Europe and became one of America's biggest cash crops. He did experiments with tobacco seeds that he probably got his hands on while he was in Bermuda and ended up creating a much better tasting tobacco compared to what the Native Americans had been using. But yeah, Rolf exported his first crop of improved tobacco in the spring of 1612, and that of course made Europe very happy. I mean, he basically single-handedly caused Jamestown's economy to thrive, but other important exports that were popular in England were sugar, indigo, and chocolate. Not only was John Rolf a significant person to arrive, but so was Jamestown's new leader named D. La War. I don't know if I said that right. And his soon to be successor Sir Thomas Gates. Anyway, his soon to be successor, a man named Sir Thomas Gates, implemented martial law to the colony in May of 1610, introducing strict codes and severe punishments. A quick definition of that. Martial law is the temporary imposition of direct military control of normal civil functions or suspension of civil law by a government, especially in response to a temporary emergency where civil forces are overwhelmed or in a occupied territory. So martial law was implemented, but now let's fast forward to April of 1613, keeping in mind that conflicts with Native Americans had been happening pretty consistently ever since Smith left in 1609. The first Anglo-Powhatan War started officially, I believe, in 1610, so war has been going on for a while between the settlers and the natives, but Pocahontas, Chief Powhatan's daughter, if you remember. Oh my God! Well, 
Um, this just came off of my table is what just happened. Um, okay. I need to stop playing around with my mic. That's the issue. But yeah, so Pocahontas, we all know Pocahontas, Chief Powhatan's daughter, his favorite daughter, I guess, actually gets kidnapped and brought to Jamestown and held for ransom. The English wanted Chief Powhatan to give back all of their weapons and tools that the Indians had apparently stolen in the numerous conflicts that they had had over the years. And even though Powhatan released many of the English captives and offered food and stuff to the colonists in exchange for Pocahontas, they would not let her go. They wanted the weapons back. I don't think Powhatan actually ever did end up returning the weapons to the colonists because Pocahontas was held for like a year and then in April of 1614 she ended up marrying John Rolfe, so... I don't know about that one. But the marriage did result in somewhat of a peace between the natives and the colonists and ended the first Anglo-Powhatan War. So now just some quick dates of significant events. January 30th, 1615, Pocahontas gives birth to her and John Ralph's son. His name is Thomas Ralph. Ralph. It's hard to say that name. I always want to say Ralph, but I'm pretty sure it's Rolf. Ralph. Rolf. Rolf. John Rolfe. Oh my gosh, I feel bad for me editing this right now. On March 17th, 1617, Pocahontas dies in England right before they're about to actually make a return trip to Virginia. So that kind of sucks that she passed away right before she was about to go back to her homeland. Um, and then April of 1618, Chief Powhatan dies and is succeeded by his brother. We're gonna have to revisit this name. Opchanakano. Okay, his brother replaced him or succeeded him, I guess is the, the, the proper term, but he proved to be a very powerful leader and a feared warrior. So by November of 1618, the Virginia Company issued new instructions and decided to discontinue the previously introduced martial law and authorized a general assembly. This is ultimately what ended up establishing the House of Burgesses. USHistory.org says, in April 1619, Governor George Yardley arrived in Virginia from England and announced that the Virginia Company had voted to abolish martial law and create a legislative assembly, known as the General Assembly, the first legislative assembly in the American colonies. The General Assembly first met on July 30th, 1619 in the church at Jamestown. Present were Governor Yardley, Council, and 22 Burgesses representing 11 plantations or settlements. Burgesses were elected representatives. Only white men who owned a specific amount of property were eligible to vote for Burgesses. And just to add on to that, it was white British men who had these rights, which is some real stinky shit given that the Poles were a ginormous help in the establishment of the Jamestown colony. The Poles weren't allowed to vote for their representatives and that did not fly with them, as I'm sure you can imagine, and they actually stopped working and staged the first strike in America, not for higher wages or for better working conditions, but for inclusion in the political process and civil rights which they did end up getting. The British colonists did eventually come around and agreed that what the Poles did for the colony deserved to be acknowledged, and they liked that the Poles were very valuable and skilled craftsmen, and those were skills that they wanted to be passed down to future generations of the colony. So the Poles did eventually get the rights that they deserved, but not after they had to put up a fight for them. Seems like the English just kind of forgot everything that the Poles contributed to the success and survival of the colony. But anyway, the the new instructions from the Virginia Company also laid out the head right system, which granted 50 acres of land to settlers in the 13 colonies. This was kind of like an incentive to get more people to, to make the jump to the new world. Settlers would also get an extra 50 acres for every person that came with him who were typically indentured servants that needed to pay off a debt. Turns out though that this would end up being the economic foundation of what would become the legal slavery system. And it was in August of 1619, probably not even a, a full month after the first General Assembly meeting happened, that the first known Africans arrived to Jamestown, likely to work the tobacco plantations. And at the time, there was no laws to govern any sort of slavery, so that happened. So in the simplest of terms, Terms, Jamestown was likely the birthplace for slavery in America. Stepping away from that issue to revisit another one, the colonists' very fragile peace that they had made with the Indians got a lot worse after the deaths of Pocahontas and Powhatan. It was said that Powhatan's brother... <laughs> I don't know why, as soon as I hear his name and I'll even say it out loud and then I instantly forget how to say it. 
he and the rest of the Indians were getting increasingly angry by more and more colonists coming over and demanding their land, not to mention all of the diseases that Europeans were bringing over and literally taking out mass populations of their people. So on March 22nd, 1622, he led a massive attack on several settlements along the James River, killing over 300 settlers. This ended up being the beginning of the Second Anglo-Powhatan War, which lasted for a decade. History.com says, In an effort to take greater control of the situation, King James I dissolved the Virginia Company and made Virginia into an official crown colony, with Jamestown as its capital in 1624. The new town area of Jamestown continued to grow, and the original fort seems to have disappeared after the 1620s. And by this time, things were already starting to go from bad to worse for the Native Americans as well. With the colonists' colonies growing stronger and stronger, Opchenica Noe's successor was forced to sign a peace treaty with the settlers who took the majority of Powhatan's land and then forced them to pay an annual tribute to the governor. But after that, Jamestown declined significantly and began to disappear. Historicjamestown.org says, In 1676, a rebellion in the colony led by Nathaniel Bacon sacked and burned down much of the capital town. Jamestown remained the capital of Virginia until its major state house, located at the western end of the island, burned in 1698. The capital moved to Williamsburg in 1699, and Jamestown began to slowly disappear above the ground. To this day, you can go and visit Jamestown town, which is something on my personal bucket list. I mean, I've never even been to Virginia before, but I believe much of the original fort had to be found and restored. I mean, the fort is over 400 years old at this point, so it probably was an actual rediscovery project. So if you stuck it out with me and made it this far in the video, I hope that you at least have a pretty okay understanding of who and what went on at Jamestown. It's not exactly a story with a happy ending, nor one that didn't come with a substantial amount of issues, but it is where it all began. Quick side note though, I was just recently on Instagram and somebody who I had known from high school apparently had visited Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts and they were just posting a bunch of photos from that experience and stuff like that. And something that actually caught my eye when I was going through that post was a sign that introduced Plymouth Rock as America's hometown. I feel like I stressed a lot in the beginning of this video how strange it is to me that Plymouth Rock gets all of the credit for America's origin when in reality, the Pilgrims probably would have never come to America at all if Jamestown didn't happen. Keep in mind, the Pilgrims made their voyage in 1620. Jamestown was started in 1607. Also, if you saw my other video talking about the history of Thanksgiving, you would know that the Pilgrims and the Mayflower were supposed to land in Virginia, where there was already a prior English settlement to join, which would be Jamestown. Like, they weren't supposed to end up in Massachusetts. They were either accidentally or perhaps intentionally thrown off course, but long story short, the Pilgrims were supposed to become settlers of Jamestown or a colony around Jamestown. Majority of the people on the Mayflower thought they were going to Virginia. So with all of that being said, my question now to you, my friends, would be why do you think Plymouth Rock and the Pilgrims got chosen and glorified, I guess you could say, as America's birthplace over Jamestown? I'll throw out some of my theories to you as just, you know, food for thought. Number one, could it be that America's true origin story was actually kind of gruesome? Like, I'm sure the Pilgrims went through some very hard times in their own right, but I don't think they had to deal with issues such as starvation to the extent that Jamestown did. I mean, much less resorting to cannibalism and things like that. In my personal opinion, I imagine that a lot of people would want to have a more pure, if that's the right word to use origin story that didn't have seemingly as many issues as Jamestown did, but I could be wrong. Number two, could it be because one of America's ideals obviously is freedom and the pilgrims were said to be seeking religious freedom from England when I don't think the settlers in Jamestown, at least at the time, had any intention of separating from England's control. I mean, that's probably why the pilgrims didn't want to land in Jamestown to begin with. They didn't want to go to a fully British controlled colony. And number three, could it possibly be that Plymouth Rock was picked over Jamestown as America's hometown because Jamestown 
probably was the beginning of slavery in America. I could imagine that writers of history textbooks probably wouldn't want to reiterate that the birthplace of our nation was also the birthplace of some of the darkest points in our country's history. I think what illustrates this theory even further to me is the fact that Thanksgiving and the whole story of the pilgrims really didn't become a thing until Lincoln made it a national holiday during the Civil War. <laughs> it would be very ironic to me, I guess, if Jamestown was credited as America's birthplace and then Lincoln made the discovery of it a national holiday during a time when the entire country is fighting over issues that were essentially created by what happened in Jamestown. <laughs> and I mean, a way to avoid that, pick Plymouth Rock as America's origin story. <laughs> anyway, that's all I got for theories. I'm sure there's many more, so definitely leave me your thoughts and opinions below. And again, please be nice. This is something I like to talk about. If you don't agree with me, that's fine. I just ask that you keep my comment section civil even when y'all are talking to each other. Well, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you liked this video of me taking you through the history of Jamestown. As I said before, this is a very long and full topic, so there are things that I had to leave out. I encourage you to do your own research and discover more things if you are curious about Jamestown. If you guys have any video essay suggestions that you would like me to cover in the future, drop your ideas below. I might cover them, I might not, but I do like to hear what you guys want to see me do next. I have some movie commentaries coming up next, so definitely stick around for those. If you would like to hang out with me in between uploads, make sure to check the description bar. I've linked all of my social media there. You can go give me a follow if you want. But as always, thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you the next time I upload a new video.